Hi guys, welcome back to the Sanderson Chronicles. It is Maureen, your host, and today, as I'm sure you've guessed, is interview day. Obviously, you guys know it's my favorite day of the week. My favorite day of, actually, the months, because it doesn't happen every week. Hopefully, we will be able to get you more soon. I'm working with Sanderson Production to get you more cast and crew interviews. This will be our last one for the foreseeable future, just because I have not, due to season two and three, which that's obviously way more important, the new seasons. Um, but due to that, it's we're struggling to get it lined up to get you more cast and crew interviews. But like I said, I'm working with our production team, and we should be able to get you some more interviews, hopefully in the next couple of months. Um, we've already gotten some yeses from cast and crew prior to the announcement of season two and three, but we have been asked to pull back and wait for production team to start scheduling them with me. So this will be the last one for a while. Um, hopefully not too long. Hopefully you won't have to wait long. But... He was so awesome to talk to. He was so fun. He had a lot of really great insight and honestly had a lot of information that I didn't, I wasn't aware of before. So it's really, really fun. It was a really enjoyable conversation and I hope that you guys like it as much as I liked it. His name's Ollie Blackburn. He was the director for episodes one, two, and three. And if you think about his episodes, he had so, and I mentioned this in the, in the interview with him, but he had so many things he had to cover. It was the, I think it was the most variable varied not variable it was the most varied three sections because there were there was a director for one two and three there was a director i think for four five and six and then seven and eight there was another director so his he had to go from you know charlotte arrives in the town charlotte and sydney have the softening charlotte and sydney have this this arguing then they have these character developments he's got to build up the character so it was he had a really really intricate in-depth job where he had to set up the rest of the season with his three and he did such an amazing job i mean i don't know how you guys feel about the first three episodes, but they're some of my favorites. And I think that his work and his direction and how he how he allowed the actors and actresses to to do what they do. It was just it was really inspiring to talk with him. It was a really good conversation. He had a lot of knowledge and he is just he was just fun to talk to. He really was. So I hope that you enjoy this interview as much as we do and we will see you right at the end, as always. I said, you've got two new series, so uh, I would take that as an up. Abs that's my view. We only wanted one more yeah. game, too, so I think that's that's a win no matter how you look at it. <laughs> that's well, exactly. Um, Did it come as a total surprise to you? Yes and no. I had talked to, because I've been reaching out to agents of the casting crew, and so some of them had let it slip that there was a series two filming. Yeah. <laughs> but I wasn't sure. It was kind of said cryptically, so I wasn't entirely sure. And so I just didn't tell a soul until it came out. Right. Yeah. But the, the Theo James one, his agent had told me that he moved on from Sanditon. And so I kind of knew that ahead of time. So I was a little more prepared than the rest, I think. Right. Yeah. So are you, um, uh, just put in a bit of context for me, are you part of the sisterhood or are you no. on your own? I'm on my own. I love the sisterhood and I, I liked yeah. participating in their Q and A's. And, uh, but I just, I wanted to do a podcast because I think that there wasn't a lot of, I wanted to hear from the cast and crew about what it was like on the set. And I didn't think there was a lot of doing that. So uh, we just started doing this. I have worked with them. I've given them some contacts of mine, but I'm not affiliated with them. No. Right. Okay. I'm just slightly obsessed about the show. So <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, what better way to deal with an obsession than start talking to people about it. <laughs> well, look, I mean, it's the obsession of people like you that got the show uh, back onto the airwaves. So um, that's, that's true. It's a big deal. I take personal credit for it. Well, you can take a share of the credit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to, I have some questions for you. Um, mm. I, I, I it, Usually these last about an hour because I tend to talk a lot, but right. <laughs> I do okay. have, I have two pages of questions that aren't sure. So um, I saw that I was trying to look up some of the stuff that you had been in. Yeah. And I saw that you had directed Victoria too, which was mm. another period piece. Did that kind of prepare you to do the Austin piece at all or? Uh, yeah, it did actually. Um, uh, when you're making films, period is a very specific thing mm -hmm. with <laughs> very kind, you know, every, every, you know, I actually, I, I'm kind of weird because I come out of, you know, uh, very gritty kind of indie thrillers and I you know which is its own thing like you know you've got mm -hmm. to know what blood you're using and stuff like that and when you get to period films there, there's very specific things that you become aware of and, and they're things that sound really obvious but um you know you'd be surprised how they can catch people by surprise so it's like 
makeup takes a lot longer hair and makeup really yeah i would never have thought that because it looks like they barely have anything on well sanditon that is the case because we did a lot of study of regency styles and portraits and actually it was a very interesting period where they actually did have much looser hairstyles they weren't nearly as controlled as you know the victorian stuff mm -hmm. or what came before them the georgian stuff where there were a lot of wigs and you know yeah. big sort of bouffants um so actually that's that's well spotted but you know in victoria that hair took a long time to do also the other thing with victoria and it tells you a lot about history as well is that um the Regency was this sort of brief glimmer of a period where people went a little bit wild. Um, and then you get to the Victorian period of Victoria and the corsets are much more severe, mm. like much more severe. <laughs> uh, so on Victoria, you know, you had to, you've got to factor in at least half an hour just to get your cast into corsets. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, and those and, dresses you know, are no joke either. And those dresses are no joke. So. You know, on a regular, if you're doing like a contemporary thriller, for example, you know, you could maybe, if you're doing well, shoot six pages a day. If you're doing a costume drama with all that kind of wardrobe and hair and makeup going on, uh, your average is about four pages a day. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's just, you, you just sort of have to factor that into your thinking you can you know you can have some days where if you're really smart and you kind of program the day well you can maybe stretch it a little bit mm -hmm. but you just there are things you know you know i did a show called startup it's people running around miami you know on computers you know you don't have to factor in an hour for those people to get into their clothes you know they put on a t-shirt yeah put some sweat on them, you know, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> um, whereas something like Sanditon, you know, you, you, you're not rolling that way. Mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. I think we take for granted that as viewers that, oh, they're just in a dress, but you're not, I mean, there's like 7,000 other pieces they have to put underneath that. You don't think about that as a viewer. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, hair and, hair and wardrobe. And, and, and the thing is, I, I don't, you can't get angry about it because and I said this on Sanditon, you know, it's called a costume drama. So, oh, yep. you know, so you better get the costumes right because that's what it's called. You know, if you do yep. a costume drama and your costumes are no good, you fail. That's like making a comedy where no one laughs. <laughs> Now, is that, <laughs> is that something you had to approve as the director of the, is the costumes that came out in? Uh, I, I, you know, I was very involved with that and, you know, and, and um, Sam Perry, who, who's, mm -hmm brilliant who did the costumes on uh on sanditon um you know I, I was very involved in in hiring her and working very closely with her and um you know i'm a history nerd like literally i, I studied history i'm obsessed by history and i put together you know this book of kind of you know regency fashion regency mm. hairstyles uh, regency architecture styles regency um kind of bathing you know, apparatus, all this kind of different stuff. I personally would love to read that. Uh, I'll send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all pictures, so it's very easy to read. Um, and, um, you know, and I went through with Sam uh, all the different, oh, you know, love this kind of collar, love this rough, isn't it cool? What she's doing with this dress, isn't this, you know, isn't this, you know, trim on this guy's coat, long coat, really good. And we sort of just did a greatest hits of the fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and actually the same with Helen Tucker, who did hair and makeup as well. Um, well, there's so many, once you start digging into this stuff, there's so many interesting things. Like, I never knew this, but in the Regency, there was a craze for women having short hair, very contemporary, like you'd see. I didn't know, that's kind of shocking to me. Yeah, no, there's low, well, you'll see in the book, there's portraits, you know, that was a thing, you know, that was a style. Uh, but it was definitely a style for them to wear their hair loose. That was, um, that was definitely a style. Yeah. So one thing that, what because I know mm -hmm. that a lot of fans had taken, I don't know, I think the fandom, they get very possessive over their <laughs> works. <laughs> those, they're not the ones who put it out. And I know that when I first started the podcast, I was asking around to people of, you know, questions they had, things they want to talk about. And one thing, was Charlotte's hair was down and people were legitimately angry at that. But yeah. I, I don't feel like that was that far off. Yeah, I, I mean, um, 
that was more in later episodes than the ones that I did. So yeah. I, I can't really speak about that, except because that wasn't a decision I was part of. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, that definitely, if you look at the paintings, that was not unheard of. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you go 20 years into the future, like what I was doing on Victoria, then yes, that would have been absolutely frowned on. Yeah, yeah. Victoria is a good show, by the way. That was that's. I started watching some of that, and I didn't. I wasn't able to finish it because then Santa didn't came, and I was I had a problem. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, there's while you're waiting for Santa to to you know be filmed, you can you know you can brush up on the rest. Exactly. Of I have a lot of things I can just binge on repeat. <laughs> Netflix is great. So when when did you arrive in Bristol to start? Had they already begun filming when you like? Because I'm not sure if they did the episodes in order or did you come in? No, I I started the show off and I started the filming off and uh, we started filming in February of 2019. Okay. And I did the first three episodes and that took us through till mid April 2019. Okay, so they they were sort of filmed in order then. Well, they're filmed in blocks. So uh, I did the first three and then Lisa did the second three and then Charles did the last two. So they're, they're filmed sequentially in that sense, but each block, do whatever. it's called cross shooting. You, you shoot the three episodes you've got, you don't shoot those in sequence. I mean, I'd love to, and I, you know, it helps the actors if you can do that, and I try to. But on TV schedules, often it's very, very, you know, it's like a spreadsheet. It's like we have five days on the street set, you know, all your scenes on the street set have to be shot in those five days. That makes sense. So a lot of the job of a director, because that's happening, uh, I mean, a huge amount of the job of a TV director is saying to, you know, because actors understandably can get a little bit confused. They're shooting, you know, um, they're shooting scene three of episode one. And then straight after that, they're shooting scene 34 of episode three. Yeah. And a lot of my job is like, okay, in episode one, you know, you've just arrived from Willingdon and you've never seen a town before and you're freaking out. And, you know, and now, you know, we're gonna send you back to your trailer after we finish. You're gonna get put into a new corset, a new frock. You're gonna get your hair redone. <laughs> you're gonna come back out. And then we're in episode three and you've seen Willingdon and, you know, and Sydney Park has brushed you off and he's being a bit of a dick and, you know, <laughs> and, and it's sort of just, really, it's just helping fix the actor in the timeline. Like this yeah. is where you are because it can get super confusing. Yeah. Um, and especially what happens is you start shooting and there will inevitably be script changes and all sorts of different things. And the actors, they're just so focused on their character mm -hmm. that, that sometimes you have to say, okay, this change has happened. You may, not have, <laughs> you know, it may not have kind of completely sunk in with you yet, but you know, X is actually not happening, you know, Y is happening instead, you know, don't worry, I'm going to explain to you, you know, <laughs> how it's working, and I'm going to explain to you how it fits in with your character, Are you cool, and then, yep, we're cool, okay, great. Especially in your block, because you go from episode one where it's the intros, and yeah. no one really knows anybody, anybody, and then episode two, they're all mad at each other, and episode three, yeah. Cindy and Charlotte have a softening, so you have, like, the whole gamut of emotions yes. in your first three episodes. Yeah, and it's bloody brilliant. Yeah, you know, it's brilliant. And, and, and it was actually very cool with Theo in particular, because he had this whole, you know, he's very keen on being as much of a dick as possible <laughs> at the start, you know, because he, he's like, you know, I want, you know, I, I, I want, I want to go on a journey here, you know, I want this guy mm -hmm. to actually like change. It worked. So it did, it really worked. His instincts were brilliant. So so it was really good fun with him being like, okay, am I, uh, so I'm a dick in this, right? I'm a dick in this uh, scene, okay. And then this scene, okay, so I'm softening up here so I can be like nice to her now. Okay, great. You know? That's kind of amazing that they yeah. do it that way because knowing what their emotions are as the series progresses, I mean, that's that takes an insane amount of focus to be able to do that. Yeah, and then the key, you know, I think the trick is, they need to do that, but within that, you need to capture the spontaneity as well. So mm -hmm. it can't just be there's this rigid 
line yep. that you're on because you know as humans we don't know what's going to happen to mm -hmm. us you know i mean sydney has no clue that he's going to fall in love with charlotte yeah um so the trick is that you know the big scene for me was the scene where after you know stringer's dad is you know had surgery performed on him where they have that kind of meeting in the street outside and that's the big moment where they that's the big romantic moment in my episodes. Yes. And the key, and you know, I tried to devote a lot of time to shooting that because it wasn't logistically a particularly complicated scene. It was just them talking. Uh, but emotionally, it was kind of the most important scene of my episodes. Yep. And I wanted to give them, build into our shooting period, time for more takes than I would normally have time to do because I wanted to give them time to play because I wanted them to have time to loosen up and really be in the moment for this, that moment that you want with these type of romantic kind of scenes where that kind of, oh shit, love's caught me by surprise. I, I didn't see that one coming. And you want the audience to feel that too. And the way you do that is you just let the actors play. Just, you know, don't get in their way do take after take because you want those little magical unexpected moments to pop through. Yeah, I think they really did that. <laughs> that was that brings me to our next question of what was your what yeah. was your process like while you were going through this? Um, on this show, it was really enjoyable. <laughs> um, I love working with actors. That's sort of one of my um, great passions as a director, um, and is working with them and just finding the emotional resonance in the story and we have great actors on this mm -hmm. i also love working with ensembles and even on you know i i did a film called donkey punch which is about as different center as you could ever imagine i was watching that trailer today <laughs> it's good <laughs> very different <laughs> very different um even though yeah, Edward Denham would probably have quite a oh good gosh, time on that boat. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the one thing that does connect them is it, that it's both ensemble work uh, with an ensemble of actors where the group dynamics is the important thing. And uh, Sanderson's kind of that on steroids just because we've had such a huge ensemble of so many different people and casting it was a really, really enjoyable process with, um, Jill Trevelick and with Belinda Campbell. Uh, Is that something you were a part of? Yeah, yeah, and that was that was a lot of fun. Um, and then something that was very good about this shoot that doesn't happen all the time on shoots was that they gave me and the actors a week of rehearsal before we shot. Oh, which is is not common. Um, should be more common. Um, but because this was such a character-based piece of work and because it was so much about the dynamics between all these people, we had a week where we kind of separated people off into kind of different clusters. You know, we had an afternoon devoted to, you know, uh, to Lady Denham and to Edward Denham and to, uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm blank. <laughs> um, uh, 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 Sydney and Charlotte, probably. Uh, no, uh, you know, um, Lily and Charlotte Spencer's characters. I'm just completely mind freezing on for a moment. Um, you Esther know, so, and Clara. Esther and Clara. So, you know, we'd have like an afternoon on that kind of chunk of characters because, you know, they know each other really well and that's their kind of their orbit. And then, you know, uh, an afternoon devoted to Sydney Babington and Crow because that's his orbit, mm -hmm. um, and so on. So we just, uh, you know, several hours devoted just to Sydney and Miss Lamb, you know, because they have a very, very specific, very unique connection. Um, and that work, that kind of week of work of just establishing those relationships between those different characters and, and, and certain characters who would have no reason to know each other. You know, like, for example, Edward Denham and Sidney Parker, you know, though they weren't, they didn't spend time with each other. In mm -hmm. um, and it was just really to sort of try and establish 
the existing dynamics between the characters, get us a shorthand between all those people and have some sort of surprise available for when they, you know, started performing on set. Okay. What, what was, oh, like the surprise of them meeting for the first, like all of them meeting yeah, together. Yeah. Okay. I thought you meant, at first I thought you meant like you had a present for them when they came on. Oh, like, wow, <laughs> that's very generous. <laughs> so um, in episode one, yeah. there, was, um, there was intros and there was a deleted scene from episode one, mm -hmm. right? Where Mary and Charlotte had, they were looking around Lady Denim's and they were sharing a joke with each other. Do you remember that deleted scene? They just watched- Yes, it. yes, the portrait. I love that scene. Yeah, the portrait, yeah. Uh, so what was, was that cut just because the, you had to fit so much in there and that just, that just didn't, like what was the process of that being cut? I love that scene. I know, I love that scene. Uh, um, and and I, yeah, and I loved also the, the montage at the start of episode one from Willingdon as well. Um, it's time, it's just time um unfortunately uh it's just you're compressing all of the you know on on certain other networks like netflix it's different you're not you know closed into if you i don't if you watch netflix you'll notice a show one episode is 52 minutes another episode is one hour you know yep. they're very they don't have advertising windows and things like that itv has got advertising windows you you're boxed into a very specific time which is 40 46 minutes, 30 seconds. Oh, wow. Including titles. So you have to just whittle things down and you have to sort of pick your battles sort of narrow tight them. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of sucks, you know, because, uh, you know, there's certain shows where we've lost stuff and I've been like, hey, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can live without that. Um, but, you know, th those scenes, I, you know, they, they were fun scenes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lot of us, too, who are binge watching it on Amazon Prime. Mm. So we forget that this was a TV series with commercials in between. Yeah. Because we don't we don't have any of that. <laughs> Well, you know, you're lucky in that you don't see it with commercial breaks. That, mm -hmm. that makes a big, big difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then um, in, in episode two that you did is the the pineapple thing. Now I've talked to, I did an interview with Kate Ashfield. Yeah. And she talked about how hard that scene was to film, the luncheon. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have one behind the scenes picture of you talking to the cast at the luncheon. Can you walk me yeah. through that that scene a little bit? Um, you know, sometimes it's the things that you think are the simplest to do. Like mm -hmm. a bunch of people sat at a dining table that actually are the most complicated to do. You know, whereas, you know, take people onto a hillside with a shotgun and, you know, a rabbit, you know, somehow the energy of that is kind of quicker and simpler to do than, um, and it's like so much of this show, it's because that scene is very complicated. It's a group of different conversations going on between different people, all of whom have different agendas all of whom have different kind of eye lines around that table that all have to be captured. Um, so you've got the, you know, obviously there's the key dynamic between Lady Denim and Miss Lamb, mm -hmm. which sort of bookends that scene, but then you've got sub dynamics between Sydney and Charlotte. Uh, there was a whole chunk that we cut out between Sydney and uh, between uh, Charlotte and Crow. There's a dynamic oh. between Lady Denham and Tom, you know, that whole kind of, you know, why aren't you making more money? There's a dynamic between Lady Denham and Edward. There's a dynamic between Babington and Esther. And, and you have to, and then there's, you know, and then there's the whole, <laughs> you know, author of it all. You know, and then you've, so you've got to, you know, it becomes a bit like sort of brain surgery. You've got to pick off all these different beats and all these different moments between 10, 12 people at a dinner table. And then because everyone sat down, the cast get kind of listless because they're stuck in chairs for two days. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we had this sort of lavishly prepared banquet that Grant Montgomery prepared that's based, you know, in the Regency, they were very into their banquets and they mm -hmm. had these, there's these incredible Regency, you know, sort of recipe manuals and stuff. They, I mean, they, they would just cook insane stuff. So, you know, Grant had prepared, based, you know, this banquet of a real Regency cookery book with sort of jellied, you know, uh, shellfish and 
all this very, very complicated stuff that started to, you know, sort of turn slightly under all the film lights. So the room got smellier and smellier and smellier as well. <laughs> and, you know, it hit it and, well. <laughs> and then the other thing is when you're doing a scene where you're in a room for two days and the cast is repeating the same lines again and again and again and again and again, they get really, really bored with it. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of one of those things where we started off where it's like, oh, it's great. We've got this lavish banquet and, you know, we've got a crane. It's going to be great. And then two days later, everyone was just like, please get us out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I saw that on film, I thought that was fake food. I didn't, not because it looked fake, but I just assumed yeah. it would be fake food. I didn't think about the other aspect that it has to look real. So it should probably be real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of my favorite dynamics in that dinner is the one between Esther and Babington. Mm. When Arthur finds out it's rotten and then you there's like a zoom in on Esther laughing and you just see Babington right behind her smiling at her and side eyeing her and I just I love that camera angle at them. Yeah. How many cameras did you have to have in there for that luncheon? A lot. Uh, I don't remember if it was two or three. We, we shot it we had actually, it was quite complicated. We had a crane with a camera in the middle of the table. So okay. you can see people from the middle of the table because often with dinner scenes, you're behind. So actually if you, in Victoria, there's a big dinner scene that I shot uh, in episode seven, um, where they go to this uh, ghastly Lord's Manor and he takes them out for a shoot and they have a sort of awful dinner. Um, and um, James Wilby is playing this Lord and he's being awful. Uh, and, you know, that we shot in the traditional way, the cameras over everyone's shoulders looking into the table. But for this, because it's such a feisty scene and mm -hmm. it's a Lady Denham going completely insane. And <laughs> it's just, you know, <laughs> and it's got all this stuff packed into it, all this sort of, you know, you know, racial politics packed into it and everything's going on in that scene. I wanted to get in, in there with, and that seems the linchpin of episode two. I want to get in there with the actor. So I wanted the camera not outside the actors looking in, I want it inside, right on their faces. So it could capture those things that you identified like those, because the other thing going back to the acting is that look that you talk about that Babington gives Esther, that's not directed. You know, I didn't say, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, to the actor, I didn't say, oh, give her a look there. You know, that comes from that rehearsal process of like, okay. these are the emotions you guys are working with. And when you come into that room and you're having that lunch, this is what you're bringing into that room with you. You know, Esther, you know, you're still madly in love with your stepbrother and you're watching your kind of ghastly but domineering, you know, uh, adoptive mother try to marry him off to someone else who's mm -hmm. utterly unsuitable. You know, so that's what you're coming in with. And, you know, Babington, what you're coming in with is that you're falling in love with this woman. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she's not even aware of you. So, you know, you're sort of, sort of teeing all of this stuff up and then joking apart the energy, you know, it is very difficult to keep the energy going in a scene like this. And the job of a director is to try and keep the actors energized for each take, even though it is the end of the second day and the food is smelling a bit and they've done the lines a hundred times, is to try to keep them spontaneous so that, you know, you can get those little moments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you can get those little, you know, that's what I was talking about with the Sydney Charlotte scene. It's those unplanned moments that the actor spontaneously will do in the moment. Yeah. You know, Babington suddenly has, you know, there's a spark between him and Esther that's then going to unfurl, you know, more and more as the episodes go on. But that's obviously in their emotional lives, that's a key moment for both of them when they look back on it. This mm -hmm. kind of dinner neither wanted to be at, 
you know, yeah. neither knew at the time what was going on between them, but they had a shared moment in the kind of awfulness of that <laughs> proceeding. It was an awful dinner. I don't yeah. know what Lady Denham It's the you. luncheon from hell. <laughs> or as, as Ruth Barrett liked to call it when we were scoring, she called, ah, oh, the racist luncheon. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's excellent. That's, that's what I refer to it as. Yeah. Um, now, in, in episode three, we see Dr. Fox which is yes. a really fun name to say. And there's the, there's so much in episode three. There's so much there yes. of him and you have the bat. Now the funny story, the bathtub scene, I, yes. I binge watch Sanditon because when I'm, there was no conclusion to it. So when there's no conclusion, I just have, to, I'm a writer. And so I don't know if that plays into it, but mm. it wasn't finished. So I couldn't get out of the world yet. So I just watched it over and over and over again. And every time my husband would come in the room, it was on that bathtub scene. Yes. Every single time he came in the room. So now it doesn't matter what I'm watching on TV. He'll come in the room and say, is that the bathtub scene? <laughs> no, it's not. But there was that scene. There was Old Stringer. There was Sydney and Charlotte by the river. There was the softening there. There was the announcement of the yeah. regatta. There was just, how did you work that? Because there's just so much in there. Yes. So how long did it take you to work episode three? Was that like the longest one for you to do? Was there more work involved in episode three that you kind of felt? Um. Well, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how those episodes are shot, that, you know, they are not shot in sequence, that they're, they're really shot sort of according to location and set piece. So, you know, you, you shoot, you know, you've got five days worth of material in my block in uh, um, uh, Sanditon, you know, in Sanditon House, in mm. a... Um, of which a huge amount of that was episode three, because mm. something like, you know, 35, 40% of episode three is Dr. Fuchs demonstration. Yep. You know, the, the proceeding to Dr. Fuchs present demonstration where Tom Parker has to convince Lady Denham to do it. Then the aftermath of that, where, you know, Tom Parker goes back and gets torn a new one by Lady Denham. So just, uh, uh, so what that meant was that I could look at my schedule and I could go, okay, we are going to do two days just on Dr. Fuchs demonstration. And the reason why we should do that, why that's a smart use of our time is we have our entire freaking cast, <laughs> like all of them are at yeah. this damn demonstration, you know, like, you know, 12, 13 principles and they all, you know, and they're, again it's like the luncheon on steroids you know they're all riffing off of each other each one's having different conversations with different ones and they're all up to tricks and you know <laughs> and you've got to capture all the nuances and what's going on between all of them uh, it's a really complicated scene mm -hmm. and then on top of that you've got this crazy doctor with all this apparatus and leeches and so um, were those real so leeches <laughs> Those were real leeches. Those were real leeches. So we, uh, so what we did with that was in one way was just very simple. Was it was, I was just like, get as many cameras as possible. And we're just gonna shoot. We're just gonna literally go around the room. We're gonna, I like to, different directors have different approaches. I like to play scenes all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it, it, so it gives the actor more time to inhabit the scene and it's more like a play mm -hmm. and a lot of actors really enjoy that but it can also get tiring for them if it's a long scene but what we did was we just went every single side of the room different camera angles different lenses play the scene through play the scene through play the scene through you know, first take, great, you know, focus on, uh, you know, Esther and Edward in, in, in this take. Next take, okay, now focus on Lady Denham and Dr. Fuchs. Next take, now focus on Arthur, um, you know, and Diana, you know, and just it becomes this sort of picking off, picking off, picking off, picking off, making sure that you're getting all the interactions, central dynamics between people. Um, so, you just need to look at your schedule and you just need to go episode three. It's a big one for Sanderton House. This is the time we need in Sanderton House to get this right. Okay. 
Now, speaking of Sanditon House, I heard that all of the all of the scenes shot at Sanditon House, like some of them look like they're in different rooms, but it was all done in one room, correct? Like the luncheon was done in the same room as Dr. Fuchs' demonstration? That's right. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that was Grant and his team, and they had various panels that they could pull in and pull out and uh, and um, and then we did other things like just smart use of camera angles and stuff to make certain parts of that room look like a different room with the right kind of dressing, you know, putting chandeliers in the right place and things like that. How much of the set, because I know there is a set designer, a specific set designer, but how mm -hmm. much of the set design did you have a say in as the director? Well, because I was starting off the show quite a lot um, and again, me and Grant come from a very similar place historically. We're both history nerds. It turns out we both like similar types of films and similar types of filmmaking. Uh, so um, we had a share. So for example, um, Sanderton House was Grant saying, you know, I think this should be like Chatsworth, but with black marble. Mm -hmm. um, and my reference for this is a scene from a James Bond film, Thunderball. Uh, and I'm a huge James Bond fan. Like, I'm a, you know, that was my first love as a kid, James Bond fan club. So I knew exactly the scene. I knew exactly what he was talking about. It was like, yeah, that's fucking, <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant because, you know, Lady Denham, she's an older generation. She would have made her money in the late, 18th century, you know, that was the prevalent style then, you know, she's filthy rich, you know, it makes mm. total sense, black and gold. Um, then with Tom Parker's house, with, you know, uh, Trafalgar house, um, I'm a big fan of, there's a very famous British architect called John Soane, who comes from that period. And I said to Grant, you know, uh, Tom Park is a very stylish guy. He's very of the moment. He's an entrepreneur. I see a bit of the John Sone house in him. And Grant was like, yeah, that, yeah, he knew it completely. He's like, that's great. And we went off in London together. We went to the John Sone house and we walked around it. And Grant was like, I'm just going to reproduce this study. I'm just going to reproduce the exact dimensions of the study. <laughs> yeah. and what do you think? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> just do that. Um, so we had a very, you know, and obviously producer Belinda Campbell was very intimately involved with all of this, mm -hmm. but, you know, we had um, a very sort of creative um, process that came from loving that period, loving the style of that period, and also wanting to show people, and I think this worked, on account of the fact that we've got fans like you who responded to show so much, we wanted to show people a different aspect of Jane Austen and that period. Mm -hmm. They might not, you've, you know, they've seen all the pastel colors and stuff and that is Jane Austen, but this is a book that's actually not quite like her other books. Yeah. You know, it's a very strange- It's darker. Book it's darker, it's very different characters, very different milieu. Um, and we felt that already gave us an invitation to show a slightly different window. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, never, we never strayed, no matter how outlandish it may feel to people, and this includes the music, we never strayed from the period. Mm -hmm. you know, we never strayed, you know, of course we heightened stuff, and we had fun with stuff, yeah. but we never strayed with what the period gave us. They loved balls, they mm -hmm. loved taverns, they loved raucous folk music. They loved that sort of design that you see in Trafalgar House, mm -hmm. all the busts of heads that all comes from the Sone House. Yeah. And they loved the bit of bling as you see in Sanderson House. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to show people the parts of the community and the world that Jane Austen lived in. Yeah. That she probably would have touched on if Sanderson had been completed. Uh, but, you know, that you don't see so much of in Sense and Sensibility and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, even down to like the streets, because when you look at regular or not regular, but other Jane Austen adaptations where it's finished, we have this romanticized image in our heads of what Jane Austen looks like because of those other pieces. It's everything's polished, everything, but that wasn't what it was. It's not like they had paved roads back then. So even when you're like walking down Sanitin, 
it's I like that there's it's a little bit messier. Yeah, well, you know, it's a town that's being built. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even today, a town that's being built is messy, let alone in, you know yeah. <laughs> the early nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. So, what what kind of things did you would you say to the cast? Like, what what direction? Can you give me an example of some of the directions you would give to the cast before they shot a scene? If you, I realized I was talking to somebody to Kate Ashley, and I realized you guys did this like two years ago, didn't you? <laughs> Yeah. So asking you to recall these things is probably a little hard, but can you remember any of the directions <laughs> that you had given to them? Well, I'd be more interested in, in finding out what the cast remember I said to you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, me? I said that? <laughs> that's that's going to be my next question that I ask people from now on. Um, you know, it's what I was saying earlier. It, it's very much just about um, reminding them of the sort of emotional journeys that their characters, the, the, the waypoints in the emotional journey that their character is on. Okay. Um, that, you know, the Charlotte of the first few scenes of episode one is a very different Charlotte to the, you know, the Charlotte of the opening scenes of episode three. Um, and it's just sort of finding very simple ways of just getting, you know, helping them to emotionally connect you know, with those phases of where the character's at. The, the biggest thing with acting is casting, is, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, is casting the right person. And if you cast someone who really feels they've got a connection with that role, who really feels that they understand and empathize with the journey that that character's going on, then that is literally 90% of the work. Mm -hmm. And really, your direction after that is, is just on helping them declutter things, you know, uh, making sure that they don't get confused or blocked at points, which can happen. And can happen, you know, costume dramas can happen because it can get very fiddly and technical. And you can get these moments where suddenly it's more about you know, the makeup and getting the corset right and, you know, making sure that the horse is going to be doing the right thing. And suddenly you, you're like, hang on, we've forgotten about the acting part. You know, this isn't, a, you know, as important as the hair and makeup is, this is about the character. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just keeping an eye on that and sort of making sure that where appropriate, uh, people are locked into their characters and making sure that they have the freedom to play with that character. Okay, uh, kind, of, kind of along the same lines. Now mm. we had talked about earlier how you had, I feel like your three episodes had the biggest stretch of all the emotions. Like I feel like you had all of them in your three. Yeah. So was there a specific emotion or, or trajectory that you wanted to make sure that you got onto the scene non-verbally kind of? If that makes sense, is that too convoluted of a question? Well, there's obviously the Sydney Charlotte thing. And as you've said, those three episodes are a classic romantic arc. They mm -hmm. start off hating each other and they end up, yep. you know, falling in love by the end of the third episode and respecting each other. So it was capturing that in a way that felt organic and unforced and uncheesy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Theo, it won't surprise you to hear has a very, very strong eye on that. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so definitely, uh, you know, if he, you know, he's very smart, he's very aware and, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's kind of got an eye on that as well. And, um, uh, and that's a part of the process. Um, and then, with an actor like Theo, who is very smart and aware, it's sort of helping him be spontaneous and not overthink things, mm -hmm. which he's brilliant at. That's why he's the actor he is. And that's why, yeah. going back to that scene in the street, that's why I gave myself more takes than I'd normally give myself, because I just wanted Theo to, to have the chance just to, just to try different things. And going back to your earlier question, you know, in between each take, I go, you know, that was a lot of fun, Theo. What, how about on this one, you try it, you know, you've, you've done that. It was really cool. Why don't you try it this way? You go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. You know, <laughs> um, so um, it's, you know, keeping an eye on that dynamic. Then I was very aware, something that I did miss was, you know, I was a big fan of 
Babington and Esther, and I'm a big fan of both those actors as well. They're my and couple. I slightly regretted not being able to sort of be further on that journey with them, just to sort of have to leave them when it was starting. Yeah. Uh, but I was very aware that, you know, that that was teeing up and to have a lot of fun with that. And likewise, you know, Charlotte was very much, she just wanted to be as much of an ice bitch as possible at the mm. start. So <laughs> yeah. she knew all the changes that were about to come. Um, so uh, it was being playful with that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I spent a lot of time working with Chris, you know, who went really all in on this role. Mm -hmm. I think he really, I think he really enjoyed having this part. You yeah. Know, I think it was a real, uh, he just really enjoyed it. It was, a, mm -hmm. you know, he, 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 he really enjoyed the process on this and on digging in a character like this. And he wanted, you know, he just wanted to be able to dig in as much as possible. And I wanted to help him do that. And he wanted, you know, often, because that character is quite a complicated character and there is a lot going on in his emotional life. Mm -hmm. And Chris took it very seriously. So both rehearsal, work beforehand, you know, uh, we had a lot of discussion and then, there would be certain scenes where he'd want another take. And I always, as a director, if an actor asks me for another take, I have to give them another take. Because mm -hmm. it means that there's something that they feel they still have to say. And yeah. sometimes those can be the best things. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of attention had to be given to that character as well. Um, then, of you know, it's sort of a, a never ending list because it's, I mean, of all the stuff I've done in terms of the cast of characters and the ensemble, this is by far the most complicated. And I've done some really complicated stuff mm -hmm. um, because we had 12 or 13 principles and all of them, and then you've got the interdynamics between all those principles and then you've got the new dynamics springing up between them. And as director, you know, we're teeing all, I'm teeing all of this up. I'm, you know, setting that ship out into the yeah. sea. And it's sort of trying to make sure, the answer to your question is trying to make sure everything is teed up and set on its way organically and in a way that will then, like a snowball, just roll and roll and roll. Mm -hmm. There was actually the scene that helped me really understand Tom's character or how Chris Marshall played it was in, it was in episode three. And it's when, because um, it's really easy to believe that he's a manic guy all the time. Like that's just who yeah. he is. Yeah. But he's not. And you can see that in episode three when there's, again, I love, there's so much about the show that's nonverbal that is down yeah. to like the way it's shot in the camera angles. Mm. And there's this, it's when Sydney and Charlotte come back in and Chris is just staring into the fire. Mm. And he just has this look of desperation and despondency on his face. Mm. And when they come in, he turns around, you could tell that he just tries to put on this different face, like a mask is yeah. had to be put back up. And it was just, it was the way the camera had focused on his face in that moment was so poignant. And that's how you understand the rest of who his character is. Yeah. And I, I yeah. thought that was really, that I just, I love the camera work in this show because there's so much that is nonverbal and that's how you understand a lot of it. Well, it's lovely to hear you say that. And, you know, I'm sure in your other interviews and your research, you've learned a bit about the camera team. Um, they are a very, very, very good team and one of the things that makes them very good is they're very aware of performance. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you work with camera people and it's very visual and, and you know, and this was a very visual show. It, you know, again, it's a costume drama, visual is sort of baked into the mm -hmm. genre, but it's deeply emotional as well. And, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and the camera team were very aware of just, you know, just hold on this close up, just, you know, let it breathe for a little bit longer, you know, because this act is doing something and we may not even be seeing it right now. It may not become apparent until later once we're editing this together and we can fully digest what's going on in their face. So like that moment, that beat of Chris by the fire. That's why as a director, I always love to try and give a little bit of a lead in you know, after we call action, just give a moment to breathe before the actual action starts. Okay. And then at the end, I always like to have a little bit of a rollout. So 
the scene will end and I don't immediately call cut. I just let it to breathe a little bit because the actors by that point are deep in character. They've acted the scene. They're feeling the emotions and sometimes something really interesting happens. I didn't realize that was how it was done. I love that. <laughs> that to me makes the most sense of how to run a scene in all of my great knowledge of filmmaking. That to me makes the most sense of how to run a scene. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of the camera work, is that something that as a director, is that something you would say, okay, I want you to, I want you to hone in here or I want you to focus here or do you just let them do their, do what they do? Um, I try to let them do what they do. I, I try to be, you know, the camera will follow you to the actor rather than force the actor to sort of hit very rigid marks. You can't always do that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, period drama, you know, it's, you've got a lot of candlelight, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. you know, you're on sets, you know, there's certain parts of the sets that, but I, you know, I try to, uh, the, the Fuchs sequence that you love so much was an example of that. I just tried to have that set lit as mm -hmm. much as possible so that the actors could bounce around. And we were just, we were on these big zoom lenses. We were shooting a bit, the style of one of my heroes, Robert Altman, where he would just set up these cameras and just, the cameras would track back and forth, just following the actors on zoom lenses. Um, so I do try to do that. It worked really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> so good job. Um, now, uh, in terms of working with the casting crew, was there, was there something about working on Sanitan that just, not not that your other things, how you might've felt was worse, but was there something about working with the cast and crew on Sanitan that just kind of made you feel, I don't know, is it weird to say warm and happy? It was, you know, it was a very warm and happy set. Um, uh, you know, it was one of, if not the warmest, happiest set I've worked on. Um, and, a lot of that is because it was just, again, when you're casting ensemble cast, it's about the dynamics of the characters and also making sure that, every, you know, it's a very finely tuned machine. Mm -hmm. And if you have someone in there who's sort of got their own agenda, that can upset the machine. So it's something I was aware of from my work on other shows, something that our casting director, George Rafelix, very aware of. You know, she cast Downton Abbey, amongst many other things. So very, very aware of it. And I think we did a very good job of putting in a cast that worked really well with each mm -hmm. other. And we're very giving. And, and, and you, know, you know, Theo is the star of the show. He's the movie star. But he was very, very, very giving. He was a real team player mm -hmm. on that show. And that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. um, so that really helped the atmosphere on set. Um, and then we had just a great crew um, of, of, of like minds. Um, one of the nice things, Bristol is a beautiful town and it's a beautiful place to shoot. Mm -hmm. And Bristol happens to have a lot of people who work in the film industry live in Bristol. Oh. Because it's just a very nice sort of quality of life. And actually, it's two hours train from London, so it's not that bad. So we had a lot of people who live in Bristol who normally sh work on shoots in London who were really thankful to be doing like six months on a TV show and be able to live in Bristol with their friend, with their family, mm -hmm. oh, with that's their good. friends. So we actually got a very high quality level of crew who, you know, normally might be shooting on quite fancy stuff. Um, uh, and that really helped the atmosphere on set as well. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, the chemistry in the set it, or on the, the cast, what we see as viewers is mm. really amazing. It's really, really good. Um, did you have a favorite place to go on set? This is a question I ask everybody. <laughs> it's I love it's the, the pineapple tavern. luncheon, isn't it? No, no, I love the tavern. <laughs> I love, you know, the tavern where Sydney and his boys mm -hmm carouse I just I really <laughs> I really kind of love and where you know we had the crazy fiddler playing music and everyone singing sea shanties I, I kind of really loved that I loved that too <laughs> and the boxing match that was in the tavern you know what was I, it yeah I didn't even notice that yeah I mean what you know what's a regency tavern without a makeshift that's boxing true. ring that's, that's <laughs> an excellent point <laughs> there's a lot of good um, memories in that place 
And, you know, I've got a big soft spot for the street set because, you know, just to get to build a, a main street to do mm -hmm. like a Deadwood thing was a real kick. Yeah. And it looked, I love the posters on that street set too. I always yeah. try to like pause and read them, but I'm not, I'm never fast enough. Yeah. <laughs> what were your biggest challenges on set while filming? Uh, oh gosh. I mean, you know, I wish I could give you something like exciting and sexy, but to be honest with you, it's just making the day. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're, you know, when you've got to spend so much time in hair and makeup and all this fiddly stuff and you're on a TV schedule, which is quite a fast schedule. You know, it was just being able to get to the end of every day and get what, be on schedule, mm -hmm. but not shortchange any of the actors. What, how long was your average day? Roughly. Uh, the, the, well, uh, I, uh, <laughs> Well, you get into all this kind of fiddly stuff of continuous days and non-continuous days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I don't want to bore you. I, um, between 10 and 11 hours, depending okay. on uh, how you want to schedule that particular day, which depends on various different factors. That makes sense. Yeah. Did you have a favorite scene to film? I have many set favorite scenes <laughs> to film. Just <laughs> in chronological order, please. I'm just kidding. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I really, <laughs> I really enjoyed shooting this show. It was just, it was just so much fun to kind of delve into that period. And it was so much fun to take on something like Jane Austen, mm -hmm. you know, that has this, you know, it's this huge, you know, as the fandom kind of shows, it's this huge sort of universe that mm -hmm. people are very invested in and you're coming in and, and we wanted to do something fun and fresh with it. Um, but, you know, so we knew that we were going to be sort of pushing some boundaries for some people, but we were confident on that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just really fun sort of inheriting a world and then sort of having fun with that world and then having this vast smorgasbord of characters to kind of play with. So I don't, I mean, the ball was a lot of fun. You know, that was shooting something like that with that sort of choreography was a huge amount of mm -hmm. fun. Um, like I say, I really enjoyed the tavern scenes. Um, I kind of pretty much enjoyed, you know, Dr. Fuchs was a lot of fun. <laughs> I, you know, I'd always wanted to work with Adrian Scarborough. I think he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And sort of, you know, getting to work with him as an insane doctor with this bonkers contraption. You know, when Grant Montgomery and his team first, because I said to Grant, you know, you know, the big thing in episode three was, you know, the sort of the big item that we had to spend money on was that contraption. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, all, you know, we were reusing all the sets. We had the stump stuff with Stringer, but it was really that contraption. And so I was like, you know, Grant, what are you going to do? And he was like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. I've got it. You know, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. He's like, I, know, I know what you like. I know what you like. You know, it's going to be like crazy steampunk. You're going to love it. <laughs> so then we, you know, I was, my head was so adult planning that whole shoot that we didn't actually get to the design of that till quite late in the day. So he sort of walked me onto the set with his team and unveiled a bit like Dr. Fuchs, unveiled that contraption. And I just started pissing myself with laughter. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was just, it was like out of all these comic books and yeah. you know, just like the most bonkers Regency <laughs> insanity. And then, you know, and then Grant was like, and then pour water in, steam's going to come out, and all this steam started pumping out, and I was just pissing myself with laughter. <laughs> so I really enjoyed those scenes, because uh, <laughs> it was like this sort of, you know, ultimate kind of steampunk invention mm. from hell. Yeah. Um, uh, I love the street scenes. Uh, I love the, you know, the, the, the big love scene between Sydney and Charlotte when mm -hmm. they finally, oh, the, you know, where Sydney pops out of the water. That was a fun one. <laughs> that's, that's on my list to talk about, surprisingly. <laughs> um, the, some of the Miss Lamb stuff I loved. The Crystal's a phenomenal actress. Mm -hmm. So, 
Uh, I really enjoyed, the, actually it's a small scene, but the scene where she's yelling at Sydney and telling him that she doesn't want to go to the lunch and I really enjoyed shooting that. That was a really, really insightful scene too. Mm, I really yeah. love that one. The one that really sticks out to me too is, and that's, I only have a couple more questions. I, I'm yeah. wa- trying to watch the time. I only have a few more, yeah. but I noticed that in episode two, when she goes to the carriage yeah, and she's trying to get onto this carriage, it shows a little bit of her naivete that she is trying to go on this carriage without any money, but yeah. the reaction of the people and like, what was that like to, to shoot? Because I mean, it's, it's an important social event. It's it, yes. the racism then is not that different than the racism that people are experiencing still yes. so you had to be sensitive but you also had to push a boundary there so what was what was that scene like to direct there uh it was intense um and and going back to what you were saying about the camera work earlier the camera was a big help there mm-hmm. you know that was the scene where we chose to be a more jangly kind of camera what does that mean close, sort of more front you know a bit more frenetic a bit more okay. like you might shoot an action film getting closer a bit more handheld you know reflect you know her sort of uh you know stressed out state of mind mm-hmm. um get people you know choose the lenses so you get people kind of leering into lens a bit more and then it's you know it's tricky because you're trying to you know it's a very uncomfortable scene and you're trying to get your other actors to do uncomfortable things mm-hmm. uh, and to sort of, you know, you know, really jeer at a, a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's sort of directing them and getting that, getting that kind of sort of gnarly energy going uh, in the scene and then getting Crystal to kind of feel the sort of isolation mm-hmm. and the, the stress of that moment definitely felt it's now that i know that you use this closer camera it makes more yeah. sense because when she was being shoved around yeah that's the first because i don't really feel because she's trying to buy a carriage without money and i don't really feel a whole lot until you like zoom in on her and she starts getting shoved around and then your heart just starts to break all over for her again that she's experiencing yeah. this in a violent way the next scene that i want to talk about and the last scene that i want to talk about is sydney coming out of the water <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not my favorite scene for the for the reasons it is for anybody else my favorite part about that scene is not him coming out of the water my favorite part about that scene is the looks on their faces from the beginning <laughs> <to> the end. <laughs> because sydney there's at one point when he realizes that charlotte is not unhappy with what she sees and he gets yes. like, that's down to the acting but theo throws this little smirk out there that's just like ha and you, you just want to laugh with him at that but then it's just the the work there is really really well done i think and so talk to me a little bit of what it was like because i mean first of all you're filming in february in yeah. the water and so that had to be hard enough as it was was that a long shoot to film was it did you take had to take a lot of time with that um yeah it's really so we're sh- shooting in february and also we're shooting in actually in estuary water so there's a very very rapid tide where we were shooting oh and and very rocky as well and not easy to access either so we didn't make our lives easy on that um but uh we planned it very meticulously you know we um i've actually done from my first film donkey punch i've done a lot of water shooting Mm -hmm. i've I've become very aware of tide charts (laughs) and (laughs) when you're shooting whether it's on a beach or on a boat, you better get to know your ch- your tide charts. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were very aware down to the minute what that tide was going to do. We were very aware down to the minute exactly how much time we had to put Theo in the water. Uh, we had to have hot buckets of water available for him. Oh, Theo was uh, took the scene very seriously. Uh, it was a very important scene, obviously, for him. Uh, so, you know, he wanted to know exactly in the schedule when it was going to be shot. He wanted to have the time to prepare for it. Uh, you know, there's all the intimacy stuff. You know, you ask in advance what the actors are comfortable with wearing, what sort of levels of nudity they're comfortable with, what sort of levels of people available on the set they're comfortable with, all of which I'm 
very experienced with on my other stuff. And, you know, going into that scene, I was like, you know, these are the things we need to have prepared and locked down. Um, so when I spoke to Theo and Rose about it, I already had a very good sense of the sort of things that we needed to be doing. But, you know, I was asking them, you know, what's important for you? You know, what, what do you want and not want to happen on this? And they were very, very, very clear about that. Um, and then we just went and we shot it. And it was bloody freezing. It was not comfortable for Theo. But, you know, also the water's very muddy. It's estuary water, so it's very muddy as oh. well, which wasn't nice either. But, you know, he is a pro. Mm -hmm. And he knew it was going to be fucking freezing. And he was like, look, it's going to be fucking freezing. I, you, you're not going to have more than half an hour with me on it. Uh, you know, make sure you get as many takes as possible, right? You know, <laughs> make sure you're prepared. Make sure you know what camera angles you're going to do. Because, you know, <laughs> I'm not... I'm not going to be hanging around, and and we did do that, and um, and I think we we did it well. And he was a trooper, and he took it very seriously, and it was very uncomfortable for him, but he kept sort of kept going, mm -hmm. and, and he was aware. And it's acting; it's an example of acting because he's freezing cold, and he's going back and forth into muddy water surrounded by sharp rocks. Yeah, but what you see is this kind of super sexy Daniel Craig coming out of the water <laughs> thing, and that is acting. That is, you know, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, uh, and that's why he is, you know, the star he is. And then all I'll say with Rose is something that Rose is brilliant at is she's a really good comic actor, mm -hmm. and she's got she's really good on comic timing, and she's really good on reactions. So you know, I felt that in that scene. <laughs> So in that scene, it would be like, you know, hmm. <laughs> be like, yeah. that was honest. That was my favorite part of the whole scene was the expressions on Rose's face and the expressions on Theo's face for the whole thing. Because my only direction to Rose is like, Rose, do you think you've ever seen something like this before? She's like, no, I haven't. <laughs> you know what something like this is meant to look like. She's like, I'm not sure if I do. <laughs> That's a great bit to know. <laughs> Um, so going to the close, obviously we know now that there is no more Theo James, obviously, but we're before that announcement, were you Sid Lot or were you String Lot? Which team were you on? <laughs> I had to ask this of everybody. But of course you didn't uh, get a whole lot of time with James and their budding or uh Leo, yeah, their budding romance. No, I mean, look, I, you know, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to be very boring to say both. I, really? <laughs> I see, I see what she sees in them both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that James Stringer is a very good friend. <laughs> Personally. Um, so obviously we know that there is no Sydney, but if you could depict a perfect conclusion with or without Theo James mm. as the director, what would you want played out? Uh, I, uh, I can't answer that question. <laughs> because, uh... <laughs> Are you officially involved in seasons two? I just want, I just want, um, I just want the conclusion to be delayed for as long as possible. <laughs> and I just want everyone to keep on getting into their complications for as many seasons as, so I just, I just want it to be as complicated as possible. Or, and not least for Charlotte. That's a good answer though. <laughs> That's an answer. Uh, and the last question I have for you is, yeah. are there any projects that you are working on now that you want everyone to know about? Or is there anything that we can be watching out for that you're doing? Um, there's nothing I can really talk about, unfortunately, much as I would love to. Uh, but what I can say is there is a, a show that I was very involved with called, very, very different to Sanditon, uh, <laughs> called Startup, which just launched on American Netflix last week. Okay. It is in, is, uh, in the top 10, it's actually number three on Netflix right it's now. It's called Star Touch? Called Startup. Oh, and okay. it's a tech thriller set in Miami with the most brilliant cast with uh, Ron Perlman and um, uh, uh, Adam Brody and Martin Freeman and Eddie Gathegi, like incredible cast of characters. It's a lot of fun. The one thing it bears in relation to Sanderton is that like Tom Parker and Sanderton, it's about a guy with an entrepreneurial dream and dodgy finances. 
<laughs> That's a perfect way to describe it. A mismanagement for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for talking with me yeah, today. And it was, it was great fun. So yeah. I hope that you will be back for, if not all of season two or three, I hope you'll be back for at least parts of season two or three. Well, uh, thank you very much, Maureen. And uh, I just want to say you know, a huge shout out to you and the rest of the fandom because you guys rock. You made this happen. We are very glad we did. This, this is going into the annals, you know, along with the Snyder Cut of like, you know, a sort of textbook campaign. So mm -hmm. well done. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll, I'll send you this a week before it comes out. It'll come out in June. This one will. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie. Bye-bye. Okay. Now, I know you're not going to walk away from this interview without having known something that you didn't know before, whether that's about the actors or, or the process or even something Ollie did. But you have to admit, too, that that was a fun interview to listen to. As I was editing it, I was like, yeah, I remember how fun this was. So I know that you guys felt the same. And I just really appreciate you guys tuning in. I appreciate you guys focusing on our channel and helping us out. And remember that the more we get rated and subscribed to, and the more we get shared, the more downloads we get for every episode, the more content we're gonna be able to bring you that's better. And that is more to what you want. Um, oftentimes, and this is, I have not been told this explicitly, it has been hinted as I've talked to certain agents, but if a podcast or uh, a journalism outlet or a media outlet is not, is not popular enough, they're more hard pressed to let their client enter into an interview with that person. So the more we get from you guys, the more, the more downloads, the more shares, the more likes, the better it's going to be for everybody and the better we'll be able to give you stuff because you know, I'm, I'm a fan just like you guys are. So we do want to give you exactly what you need. And I feel like I have a good handle on what you guys want. If I don't let me know, reach out to me because I really do want to be connected with you. And I really want to make sure that I get you exactly what you want and exactly what you're looking for with this podcast. And I'm so glad to be doing this while we amp up to season two and three. On that note, if you would like to reach out to us and let us know your thoughts, if you want to be a part of this podcast, if you want to do... The one thing that we started off, what we wanted to do, was we wanted, in addition to the cast and crew interviews that we did every four episodes, was we wanted to interview the fans on their opinions about the show, on their desires for the show, on what the show meant to them, on why they connected with the show. We want to interview you as we would a cast and crew. And you don't even have to co-host the episode with us. We can just ask you questions and you can answer and we can talk Santa to what we like, what we don't like. So we would like to start doing that to fill the gap for the lack of cast and crew interviews. So if you are interested in being interviewed by me, please reach out to us at the.sanditonchronicles at gmail.com. You can go to our Facebook page at Sanditon Chronicles at the Sanditon Chronicles dash Sanditon Family Fan Club. You can find us on Twitter under at Sanditon The, or you can just search for the Sanditon Chronicles on Twitter. We'll pull up. And the same thing with Instagram. We are at the.sanditon.chronicles, or again, pull up the Sanditon Chronicles on Instagram and you'll pull us up. You can message us on any of those platforms. You can message us in any of those ways that you want to. And I usually am very quick to respond. I try to hit everybody. I try to respond to everything. And we also have our YouTube channel. Um, that you can watch. And I, I, of course, I understand that it's probably hard for some of you who have been our longtime listeners from the beginning, who are now receiving the audio on Podbean and the video on YouTube. I'm sorry about that due to um, technical issues and, and restrictions. We had to, we had to switch up our format. So if you are more interested in the video, you can always watch us on YouTube. If you're driving your car or you're cooking dinner or whatever, you just want to listen to us, Podbean's the way to go. We're all audio on there now, and we will be from here on out. Um, and if that changes at any point in time, I will for sure let you know. So thank you for being a part of this journey with us. Thank you for continuing on your journey with us. And thank you for just continuing to support us in this channel. And we really appreciate you guys. We love you guys. And we will see you next week where we are talking Sydney Parker. Have a great week, guys. We'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.